Hey everybody and welcome to the 5 Bytes Podcast. I'm your host, Rory Monahan. The podcast as always is brought to you by my sponsors, Goliath Technologies who will be at the upcoming Citrix Synergy event in Atlanta. If you are looking for a best in class monitoring and analytics solution for your Citrix environment, stop by booth 509 to check them out. And also by Liquidware who will feature in one of the upcoming news stories on this week's episode in relation to announcements from Nutanix at their .next conference. And now for some news. There's quite a lot to cover in announcements from Microsoft Build, MMS, and also Nutanix.next. But let's get started with Build. First up, a new Windows terminal was announced which will support CMD or command line, PowerShell, and Windows subsystem for Linux. According to The Verge, it will provide themes and personalization options and also support emoji and GPU based text rendering. This news has been met with a lot of surprise and delight by developers. What interests me most, other than a single UI for managing my CMD, PowerShell and Unix, is the ability to open multiple tabs in commands and PowerShell, which is something that was introduced in an earlier Windows 10 preview. I was a little worried that feature was just going to be completely dropped, so it's good to see it here. It will also be nice to have that see-through effect and customization that the hardcore Linux users have enjoyed for many years. The terminal is open source and can be found on GitHub already. The downloadable UI should arrive by mid-June. And on the topic of Windows Subsystem for Linux, or WSL, WSL version 2 was unveiled at build. There have been some changes in the new architecture for WSL2 that will allow for dramatic file system performance increases and full system call compatibility, meaning you can run more Linux apps in WSL2 such as Docker, which is very interesting. For the first time ever, Windows will ship with a Linux kernel, which was like one of the big headlines that tech journalists were running with after build. The kernel will be built in-house by Microsoft from the latest stable branch based on the source available at kernel.org. In initial builds, Microsoft will ship version 4.19 of the kernel. This Linux kernel will be fully open source and when released will have the full configuration available on GitHub. Also at build, Microsoft announced an online visual code editor. You can already sign up for the private preview today, but no date has been provided for its actual release. It could prove useful for quick edits and for its easy access from anywhere. So if you're one of those people who makes quick edits to scripts on GitHub just through the Markdown UI or use some other online code editor for different languages or different code, this could be pretty exciting for you. According to a report from TechCrunch.com, Red Hat and Microsoft also launched a new open source collaboration named Kida. It allows users to build their own event-driven applications on top of Kubernetes. Kida handles the triggers to respond to events that happen in other services and scales workloads as needed. The article states that Kida works in any public or private cloud and on-premises, including, unsurprisingly, Azure Kubernetes Services and Red Hat's OpenShift. With this, developers can also now take Azure Functions, Microsoft's serverless platform, and deploy it as a container in Kubernetes clusters, including on OpenShift. If you've been following the podcast, you'll know that a lot of vendors are jumping on the Kubernetes train right now. So this isn't all that surprising. There was also some edge news. Some new privacy tools were shown They have the ability to show you how your data is being used by sites across the web. The privacy dashboard concept allows users to choose from clearly labeled preset levels of information sharing, which will automatically configure the browser to protect its users, with options to configure the exposure to third-party tracking and the impact to site compatibility. Most interesting to me at least is the announcement of full Internet Explorer 11 compatibility. It said that the browser can seamlessly render legacy IE-only content in high fidelity inside of Edge. More information is expected later this year. As a bit of a side story, in addition to what I just reported on Edge, The Verge have reported that a Mac OS version of Edge has been leaked. Microsoft has been working to support Mac keyboard shortcuts and it has been experimenting with button placement so its browser looks and feels like a Mac app.
Microsoft is also adding in touch bar support with options for media control sliders and the ability to switch tabs from the touch bar. The links for downloading Edge for macOS were still alive at the time of this recording and I have installed the Canary build on my own MacBook Pro. I have the developer build on my Windows 10 machine and so far I'm really liking these new Edge browsers. You should check them out if you haven't yet. And keeping on the topic of Edge, Tom Warren of The Verge posted an excellent in-depth article detailing how Microsoft came to the decision to work with Google on its Edge browser. The article suggests Bill Gates was one of the people consulted about the decision to embrace Chromium and there's a great story about the Microsoft team using Google Hangouts to collaborate with the Google engineers. Kind of a tip of the hat, like you guys are helping us out. This is your code base. We're not going to make you use Teams or Skype for business. We will use Google Hangouts. And in one of the Google Hangouts, when the conversation turned to a feature Google had put on the back burner, the Microsoft engineers said they were already working on it to the delight of the Google team. It was a case in which the Google engineers started working on something, put it to the side, and then the Microsoft engineers finished it for them. It's a really fascinating look into the relationship of the two in both the past and present. I strongly encourage everyone to give it a read. At MMS that was held in Minnesota this week, they got an exclusive announcement of their own in the form of a preview for MBAM, which is Microsoft's BitLocker administration and monitoring tool, showing that it has now been integrated natively into the SCCM console. This appears to be a future roadmap for MBAM outside of the existing MDOP suite, which is Microsoft Desktop Optimization Suite, that had historically contained MBAM, Advanced Group Policy Management, AppV, UEV, and Dart. The MDOP suite hadn't been updated since 2015, with many of its products only really getting some fixes in the last three or four years. So the fact that MBAM has been moved into SCCM in this way suggests that MBAM does have a future. Rather worryingly, it also appears that at MMS, it may have been announced that AppV is no longer under active development, which I think pretty much everyone already realized. But more worryingly is the fact that it was suggested that it will continue to ship through 2020 in Windows 10 which, you know, it's May 2019 through 2020 only gives about a year and a half. So what do customers who have possibly hundreds or many applications sequence in AppV today going to do? At the moment, MSIX isn't mature. Not every application that works today with AppV 5 or 4.6 is going to work in MSIX. Will it work by 2020 or by the end of 2020 or by the beginning of 2021? At this time, that's uncertain. If we're optimistic, I would say that MSIX will be superior to AbV and will pass it in terms of functionality by 2021. But again, that's no guarantee. So if you want to be strategic, you may want to look at an alternative like Numescent Cloud Paging. I also noticed something pretty interesting in relation to AppV this week. Microsoft's own Michael Nihas shared a tweet with a link to a user voice entry by the awesome Dan Ga asking for support for deploying AppV applications via Intune. That particular feature request has amassed over 296 votes and if this is something you'd like to see, please add your own votes. The FIDO Alliance have announced that Microsoft have achieved FIDO 2 certification for Windows Hello as of the May 2019 update for Windows 10. This week, Microsoft also announced MSIX App Attach, which promises one package everywhere, apps available instantly with reduced network usage thanks to read-only mount, block level transfer, and shared access. The apps can run on-prem or in Windows Virtual Desktop, and in the info shared on Twitter, it looks, it kind of looks similar to application layering, but details are short at the time of this recording. The lead of the MSIX team did respond to me on Twitter when I said it kind of looks like application layering. He said, yes, but better. 
So I'll be interested to see what the actual finished product does look like. Uh, an application layer that maybe contains an MSIX application. I mean, it could be interesting. Real-time delivery of application layers today is like instant. It's very, very quick. But in other products that do that, there's a limitation on the types of applications that will work when delivered real-time as an application layer. And also, obviously, if it's using MSIX in addition to that layer, MSIX also has limited compatibility right now for a lot of Win32 apps. So I guess we'll just have to watch this space. .NET 5 has also been announced, and it has been announced as the successor to the current .NET Core version 3. It will be unified, so the same version will work across all operating systems, including Linux and Mac OS. Microsoft is such a massive company, there were many, many other highlights at Build, but I'm not going to cover all of them because the podcast episode is already getting pretty long. But some of the other highlights included Election Guard, which I covered on another episode of the podcast, which could help protect the integrity of democracy in some countries and was being rolled out as a test in some European countries with upcoming elections. There have also been some developments around mixed reality and also a new fluid build ability for collaborating on documents with others in Office 365. Kind of seems a little bit like Google Docs. So that would be pretty cool and interesting. Probably better than SharePoint for collaboration. Well, there is that and much more. If you want to catch up on some of the other highlights, check out 5bytespodcast.com, go to episode 71 and click on the reference links, or you'll find the reference links together in the description of this episode of the podcast on your podcast platform of choice. There's also some big news from .next in Anaheim. Nutanix showcased its new frame desktop and application provisioning product, which will bring frame to Nutanix AHV which of course means you can now run frame on premises, which is pretty crazy and amazing. This is very interesting. Nutanix getting into the business of virtual desktops and published applications running on premises certainly could mean Nutanix trying to take a slice of the pie currently divided up by the likes of VMware, Citrix, Parallels, Microsoft, and others. Jack Madden of BrianMadden.com have also highlighted that Liquidware entered into an OEM agreement with Frame and Nutanix earlier this year. ZFrame will use Liquidware Profile Disk to support non-persistent desktops and address all of the Office 365 Outlook and OneDrive issues that have been talked about for many years, and that is something that FS Logix solves on the native Windows Virtual Desktop side. Sticking with Nutanix.next, Nutanix also announced Mine, which, is, which they say is an integrated intelligent data management platform. It will allow you to unify your primary and secondary data protection operations, enable cloud-like scalability, and deliver one-click simplicity for all of your backup infrastructure. Further to this, Nutanix Mine can be easily deployed, managed, and scaled to meet most enterprise data availability requirements. Mine simplifies the full life cycle of data backup operations, including the initial sizing performed via Nutanix tools, product procurement, deployment management, and product support. You can check out Nutanix.com slash products slash mine for more information on that. I also noticed that Netrix, which is very popular as a AD change auditor tool, presented their own tool at Nutanix.next called Netrix Auditor for Nutanix Files. You should be able to quickly and easily view and audit any changes to the Nutanix Files permissioning. And now for this episode's weekly webinar. On Thursday, May 9th, which is right around the corner, Jeremy Muskowitz, who is a fellow Microsoft MVP and is also currently the CTO of Policy Pack, will be presenting a CUGC webinar. In it, you'll see how to manage all your applications, desktops, browsers, Java, and security settings. Policy Pack works with Citrix, your desktops, laptops, VDI, 
and pretty much anything Windows. No extra infrastructure is required and you'll be up and running in five minutes. I had the pleasure of seeing an in-depth demo of the product this past weekend at the EUC Masters Retreat. It was so amazing that my boss has reached out to speak with Jeremy directly about possibly trying to try it out in our environment. And now for this episode, scripts, tricks, and tips. Damien Von Robes at Syst and Deploy shared a pretty sweet looking prereq check GUI made with PowerShell and WPF, which is perfect for example, say when you're doing an in-place upgrade with SCCM. In his example, he checks to ensure that the device is a supported model, has enough disk space, RAM, is plugged in, and has secure boot enabled. But this could be used for many other types of scenarios too and looks great. Before I wrap up this week, I'd like to say a quick thank you to Steve Greenberg, the local Phoenix Citrix user group community, and all at ThinkCline Computing for putting on a pretty awesome conference in Scottsdale last weekend, the EUC Masters Retreat. Now that Bryform is no more and E2EVC, which is a great virtualization conference, is no longer being held in the United States, truly independent and technical conferences in the U.S., in the EUC space in particular, are pretty rare if non-existent. If you're looking for the best and probably the most unique experience for a tech conference focused on virtualization and end-user computing, you won't want to miss the EUC Masters Retreat 2020. And that's it for another episode of the podcast. As always, thank you guys so much for listening.